Hi, this is Michelle with the Monadnock Center for History and Culture. Welcome to our first online Lunch and Learn. Today we're going to be looking at the Old Street Road in Peterborough. We did this program a couple months back at the Monadnock Center and it was sold out. Several people asked me if we could repeat the program, so I thought it was the perfect way to start this new online series of Lunch and Learns. So grab your sandwich and let's get started. Old Street Road gets its name from the origins of Peterborough. So in 1738, the Peterborough proprietors, which was a group of investors from Concord, Massachusetts, they received the land grant for what would become Peterborough. And at their meeting in December of 1738, they vote to, quote, agree with some suitable person to cut and clear a good road from New Ipswich to the meeting house lot in said township as soon as may be. And that road would become the street of Peterborough. And I'm going to highlight this just so we can orient ourselves. So here's Old Street Road. So down here going to New Ipswich and then up to the Meeting House lot, which would be up around about approximately there. Here is today's Route 101. So in the, in the 18th century, people would have just referred to this as the street. Um, as the town center shifts down into the river valley in the 1830s with the Industrial Revolution, eventually this would involve, evolve into the Old Street and then to today's, what we call it today, Old Street Road. So that's where the name comes from. We know that the earliest industry in Peterborough was somewhere down here at this southern end of the road, and that was a tannery. We also know that the first store in Peterborough was somewhere up in this vicinity, um, and it was established about 1770. There was also in this area a blacksmith shop, which ran until about 1830. Now the map I'm showing you here on the right, this is a, a copy of a handwritten map that was created in 1787 of the proprietor lots, and you can see the names of some of the settlers that have purchased lots. You can also see the names of some of the proprietors, Fowl, Prescott, and Gridley. These are all proprietors and Hill. Um, they didn't live on these. They, um, they just sold them. These just have not been divided up yet. You can see some that are blank. Those have not been sold as of 1787. But for right now, we're going to concern ourselves with this lot down here, A. Scott. And here is Old Street Road. I'm going to highlight that line of the road for you. Now, Alexander Scott came to Peterborough uh, about 1750, and he purchases this lot and builds a tavern on the site. And in fact, it was at this tavern that the only time the Peterborough proprietors actually came and met in Peterborough was a meeting that was held there in 1753. Alexander Scott was a veteran of the French and Indian Wars, and a friend and fellow veteran, Robert Wilson, purchased Alexander Scott's tavern in 1758, and it became known as Wilson's Tavern. Now, Wilson's Tavern was the site where on the early morning of April 19th, 1775, a rider came up into the dooryard of the tavern to announce that shots had been fired at Lexington and the American Revolution had begun. That day, the able men of Peterborough assembled there, some only armed with pitchforks and green flails, it is said, and they marched down into Man Massachusetts to join the battle. Robert himself becomes quite decorated during the Revolution. He earned the rank of major at the Battle of Bennington, and he was held in gr great esteem by General John Stark. Robert died in 1790 at the age of 57. Shortly after that, the tavern burns, 
and it took with it all of the early records of Peterborough. Robert had been a selectman, and the town records were stored there, so those were lost in the fire. These pictures here are from the early 20th century, when the DAR marked the spot of Robert Wilson's Tavern and that assembly to respond to the call of the alarm at Lexington. Robert had two sons, James and William. James would study the law and he goes on to become a US congressman. William inherits the tavern and after the fire, he ultimately rebuilds a little further up the road. So he builds a new tavern in 1797 at what is today the corner of Old Street Road and Route 101. And this house still exists today. You can see it from the street. And it became the leading hotel in the town until the 1830s. It was substantial. It had 21 rooms. 11 fireplaces, and even a ballroom. The ballroom spanned this front of the tavern on the second floor, very typical arrangement for a ballroom in an early tavern. So this whole length was a ballroom. It was a center for social life. They had country dances in the ballroom, uh, so much so that dancers carved their names into the woodwork to show that they had been there. And this was even the spot where the Peterborough Lyceum was founded in 1827. This was also a very popular tavern with travelers. William's wife, Dosha, was famous for her cooking, so this was a popular spot to stop for a meal and a place to rest. Um, on your way through. And in fact, Old Street Road would have been a fairly busy travel uh, thoroughfare. In the 18th century, there were great livestock migrations that would happen, and cattle ranchers down in the central part of Massachusetts would move their herds of cattle up through this area and into what is now the northern part of Antrim, Hillsboro, and Washington, New Hampshire, to these great upland pastures and the graze the cattle there for the summer and then return them back down into Massachusetts at the end of the season once they'd fattened up on all that grass. And those would have passed right in front of this door. And this was a wonderful place for those drovers to stop and rest on that journey, which would have taken a couple of days. The, the ballroom in addition to the other chambers that were available to rent, the ballroom had a system of partitions that were uh, suspended from the ceiling that could break this up into small sleeping chambers. And that would have been a popular choice for the drovers. It would have been less expensive than a, than a bed chamber, but also much less private you would often be bunked into one of those partitions with someone else, someone you didn't even know. That's very different than today when we want a private room and a private bath. By about 1830, the tavern keepers, William and Dosha, they're getting older. And again, the town's focus and travel patterns have moved down into the river valley and the tavern ceases to function as a tavern anymore and becomes a private residence. And it remains a private residence right up into the early 20th century. In the 19 teens, the property was acquired by the Society for the Protection of New England Antiquities, today known as Historic New England, with the idea that it was gonna become a historic house museum. And you may have visited some of historic New England's house museums. We have one right down in New Ipswich, the Barrett House. They have properties throughout New England. Ultimately, that plan did not come to pass. And historic New England sold the Wilson Tavern out of their collection. And then it became a private residence once again. It is now being renovated and restored for use as a B&B. &B. And I think it's kind of wonderful to think about that returning, that building returning to its roots as a lodging place in Peterborough. Now let's move up the road a little bit 
as we move along, we're going, we're following along the road in our journey on Old Street. And we're going to jump around in time a little bit. That's just the nature of it. This is the stone barn. And the stone barn has a very interesting history of how it came about and, and more recently, what will happen to it next. So a little bit of a backstory here. The stone barn was built by a woman named Elizabeth Cheney and her daughter, Elizabeth Cheney Kaufman. Elizabeth Cheney was the widow of Benjamin Cheney. Benjamin Cheney is one of those great 19th century rags to riches stories. He had started out as a shop apprentice, a, a storekeeper's apprentice in the early 19th century and eventually becomes one of the richest men in the United States. He took his experiences working with stagecoaches and moving around freight and valuables, eventually creating what we know today as the American Express Company. When he died in the 1890s, he left most of his fortune to charity, but also the family was very well provided for. And it was at that time that Elizabeth and her daughter decided to build a new country repeat, re, retreat excuse me, in Peterborough. Prior to that, Benjamin and Elizabeth had uh, restored an old farmhouse and were using that as a little summer getaway. But Elizabeth decided to create something much more substantial. And you can see here, this is a substantial estate house with formal gardens. It had a deer park. It had uh, places for riding. It had a horse barn and a working farm. The, uh, the stone barn was part of that working farm. This building was built about 1910. It was clearly designed by an architect. We don't know who the architect was, and that has been something that has been researched and debated for many years, and maybe one day the magical piece of documentation will appear that tells us who designed this. It's unusual. We don't see a lot of stone barns in New Hampshire. Most of our barns are made from wood. By the 1940s, uh, Elizabeth the Elder had passed away, and Elizabeth Cheney Kaufman uh, gave this barn and the house that sits to the left of it to um, a friend, a Boston dentist named Dr. Favre, and I don't know for sure, but I think that could be Dr. Favre standing there in the doorway in this photograph. And at that point, its use as an as for agriculture ends, and it hasn't been used for agriculture since that time. Over the last 25 or 30 years, there have been multiple different development schemes for uh, how to use this property and not one of them has been able to come to fruition. In more recent years, the barn was beginning to really deteriorate. And thankfully, a group of local investors purchased the property and have, been, have invested a huge amount of money in stabilizing the barn um, so that it doesn't just fall in. What this ultimately will become, I think only time will tell us. Now let's turn up the street a little further and we're going to look at the old cemeteries and the meeting house. So if you've been on one of our fall cemetery tours, you'll know that we take a, a walk through this cemetery. This, and this is the one that's visible from Old Street Road. This is actually the second burying ground in Peterborough. The first cemetery, which was uh, first used in 1753, is a little further up the hill and right at the crest, and it was built next to the first meeting house. They found that the soil there was very hard to dig, and that was only used for about five or 10 years, and then this cemetery was laid out a little further down the slope of the hill. This uh, little sketch is actually the end papers from from the Morrison history of Peterborough was done by Nora Unwin, the famous illustrator who lived here in Peterborough. And it shows us 
the first cemetery and the second meeting house and the second cemetery. So here we have, right here, it's just small, the first cemetery. And then this is the second meeting house right here. The first meeting house would, was built in 1752. It would have been a very small, rude, simple building. It was just something that was needed in order for a community to become an incorporated town. You needed a meeting house, you needed to settle a minister. Um, so it wasn't something that would have been heavily invested in. And even by 1752, we're just seeing the introduction of sawmills. So it would not have been a refined type of architecture. By 1777, the community is now incorporated as Peterborough and growing, and there's um, more money to invest in a, a more substantial meeting house structure, and that's when the second meeting house is built. Now, the meeting house, um, very typical type of style of 1770s meeting house. This had boxed pews that had seats in them that were hinged so that people could stand up during the prayer part of the services. And it is said that when the prayers were over and those seats were slammed down, it sounded like a fusillade of muskets going off. This building never had any heat in it, so you can only imagine how very cold those winter Sunday services would have been. At much like the other things along Old Street Road, by 1830, this meeting house is no longer useful to the community because so much has shifted into the River Valley. We have a new church in down in the River Valley, what is today the Unitarian Church. There's a new town hall. So they don't need this building anymore. And in 1829, it was sold for $75.25. It was moved um, further down Old Street Road and then ultimately disassembled. I would dare say there are probably a lot of pieces of the meeting house that are in buildings and barns all through Peterborough. Another thing that I wanted to show you on this sketch is this tree right here. This is the beech tree and it no longer exists, but this was the place where people would gather between the services on a Sunday. You have to remember in the 18th century, church services on a Sunday were all day from morning until evening and there would be a break in the middle of the day for lunch and you know for people to get out and get some fresh air and stretch their legs. And this is the place where people would gather to talk about business, to um, make deals, uh, to gossip. There would be kids playing and teenagers flirting. And this was really this sort of centerpiece for people to connect um, within the town. And last, let me just show you right here. Here is a partial outline of that second cemetery that we saw the photograph of. And this is where most of the 18th century citizens of Peterborough are buried, including William Diamond, who was a uh, drummer boy at the Battle of uh, Lexington. Robert Wilson, the tavern keeper, is buried there. Many other of the leading citizens of the time, and in including some others like Margaret Stinson, who was thought to be a witch. It's a wonderful place for um, exploring an 18th century cemetery, and hopefully we'll get back there for a tour this fall. Now, that whole property where the meeting house was and adjacent to that second cemetery was purchased in about 1900 by Elizabeth Cheney of the Needles Estate that we talked about earlier in relation to the stone barn by her daughter-in-law, and her name was Mary Cheney Schofield. She had been, Mar Mary Cheney was married to Elizabeth's son. He passed away fairly young. She remarried a Harvard professor named Schofield. Now, Mary Schofield was 
a woman of great energy and vision, and she decided to build this pretty magnificent estate house in the Italianate style um, and named it East Hill for the, for the hill that it's built on. She dove into town affairs. Um, she was very involved in the war effort in World War I. In fact, her son was the first person from Peterborough lost in World War I. His name was William Cheney. He was an aviator. And she also uh, was a vice president of the National Women's Land Army, which was an organization dedicated to replacing the young men who had left America's farms to go fight in the war with young women. And there was a training site at this estate in World War I to train young women in agricultural work. Mary was not one to be without a project. And by the 1920s, she this estate is done. She's done tremendous like landscaping. You can see this beautiful lawn leading down to these stone gates. The other image shows from the stone gates looking back to the house. Gorgeous view of Monadnock there. So she um, sells the property and um, builds another house in Peterborough called Beside Still Waters, which is on um, New the Nubanusit River. And that's a sort of a French provincial style house. The building is sold and becomes the Kendall Hall School for Girls. So it's a private independent school for young women. And I love this picture because it gives you a sense of what the inside of the house looked like. And all these young girls here with the roaring fire. During the summers after World War II, the Kendall Hall School for Girls rented the facility to Johns Hopkins University, where they held their Institute for International Relations and brought people from all around the world to study, to, um, you know, to encourage peaceful international relations. In the 1950s, the Kendall Hall School for Girls closes and the Carmelite Friars buy the property to use as a retreat house. And once the Carmelite Friars are in residence there, they welcome the public to enjoy the expansive grounds. And many people will remember walking their dogs there and having picnics on that big lawn. It was a wonderful, wonderful place to spend a beautiful afternoon. And that it was sort of open in that way during daylight hours for, for many, many years. In the early 90s, the friars uh, decide to reduce their real estate holdings and they sell the property and it once again becomes a private estate. At that point, the public was no longer welcome to just wander around the grounds and um, the owners started a very long restoration process to bring, bring the house back to its original kind of grandeur. Sadly, in the early 2000s, on Valentine's Day, the house caught fire. There had been work going on in the house, and it, I, I think it was some sort of electrical problem that started the fire. But the family was not in residence when it happened. And in fact, I've been told that the first calls went into the fire department from people living on Vine Street all the way across the River Valley who could see the flames. Um, by the time that they got there, the whole place was completely involved and they were unable to save it. So sadly, it was lost. Now, let's hop up the street a little bit further and look at another estate house built in that early 20th century time frame. This is the Robert Parmalee estate, and it might look kind of familiar to you. Robert Parmalee was um, what today would be like a venture capitalist. Um, and had made his fortune. And he and his wife had um, visited Peterborough and his wife loved it here. And they wanted to uh, build a little summer retreat to be able to get away from the city and enjoy the country in the summertime. <clears throat> so Robert built this house for his wife. And then sadly, his wife passes away 
And Robert is not, it it's just reminds him of his wife. It's, it's too sad for him to be here. And so the house is not being used. And around this same time, there was a movement afoot in Peterborough to build a community hospital. At, in the early 20th century, the closest hospital was in Keene, or you had to go towards Nashua to get to a hospital. And that really meant in those days that if you were ill and needed hospital care, it meant a very long and probably bumpy and uncomfortable ride, um, quite a distance to be able to get the care you needed. And so a group of people, including Mary Cheney Schofield and Elizabeth Cheney, all of these ladies, as well as gentlemen in the town, started a fundraising campaign to create a community hospital. And um, when Robert Parmalee was asked if he would consider donating the house, he agreed to do it. He did, it, he did specify that they had to raise enough money to be able to pay the operating costs of this hospital for at least five years and to outfit it properly in, the modern, in a modern way. Um, I think he wanted to ensure that if he gave the house, there would be adequate resources to make sure that it wasn't in vain. And um, by 1918, this fundraising campaign is really in full swing. They're having public meetings, they're soliciting donations, and then the 1918 flu pandemic hits. And I have no doubt that the experience of that pandemic really was what made it possible for the hospital to happen. Because even before the pandemic is over, the committee for a Peterborough hospital has announced that they have raised enough money for the operating costs and that they have a donor who will pay to outfit the hospital with the most modern equipment. And shortly after that, the hospital is created. And I just share these pictures because I just love these. Um, the one on the left is the nursery and you can see the little tiny cribs for the newborns there. And on the right, this is the waiting room. And if you're old enough and you've been around Peterborough long enough, you remember this was right in front of you when you went in the original hospital entrance. It, the entrance has since been shifted with the renovations to the building. This table right here in the front, uh, this tavern table actually is now on view in the Monadnock Center's museum that came to us during uh, one of the renovations of the hospital. Now I want to finish up with one of the private houses along Old Street and this is right near the hospital. This is the Gordon House and you may recognize this as the Elizabeth Yates McGreal House. This is part of Sheeling Forest. This house is one of the oldest houses in town. It was um, purchased by Samuel Gordon in 1779 and the deed said with buildings thereon. So we don't know if it was the house, but probably was. So we know this house dates from at least 1779. This is a very, very typical uh, early center chimney cape house of the late 18th century. Many of the first houses in town and in all of the towns around here would have looked like this. And this house was used as a farmhouse for, you know, 150 years. And then in 1940, Elizabeth Yates McGreal and her husband William purchased this house and, the, and lived there. She lived there for the rest of her life. Many of her famous books were written while living there. You know, Amos Fortune, Free Man, and many others, Carolina's Courage, the ones that you would remember. She also found that there were Moses Eaton stencils in two of the rooms, and she wrote a book about that called Story on the Walls. In recent years, after Elizabeth gave the property and the surrounding land to create Sheeling Forest to the state of New Hampshire, this house served as like a caretaker's house for the property for many years. And then more recently, in the last 10 years or so, it's been left vacant. And um, it has really deteriorated. It's kind of run to rack and ruin. But I'm happy to say that thanks to the efforts of the Peterborough Heritage Commission, the state of New Hampshire is now developing a multi-year plan 
to restore and steward this property into the future and not let it just run to rack and ruin. And there's lots of different issues they have to deal with, drainage issues and lead paint and things like that. But the happy news is that this house will be brought back to its original um, beauty. <laughs> and with that, I want to finish up with today's Lunch and Learn. I want to tell you that you can continue to connect with us at the Monadnock Center. If you go to our website, monadnockcenter.org, you're going to find blog posts and different things of interest there. If you're into Facebook or Instagram, you can find us on those. We do posts all the time, historic pictures, trivia questions, um, newspaper clippings, all sorts of different things. It's a really fun way to get some little tidbits of history and culture. And in we are also doing things on YouTube now. So in addition to this Lunch and Learn, we'll be adding more as time allows. And we've started a new set of videos called 10 Minute Tutorials, which are show you how to use free online resources to do local history research. They're really, it's really kind of fun and uh, great detective work. And you can find out about your house or your that old cellar hole or that ancestor that used to live in temple or whatever there's tools in those 10 minute tutorials to make that happen for you. And finally, if you are a Menadnock Center member, I thank you. Your membership makes these kind of programs possible. And if you're not a member yet, I hope you'll consider joining us. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time with Lunch and Learn.